This will be a very different message than what you're used to seeing. I've asked Trevor to team preach it with me. So we're going to tag team. He took a group of our church through the fruit of the Spirit on Sunday Night Life in the early part of the year, and he did a fine job with that. So I wanted him to be able to share some of his insights with you, some of the insights that we worked on together, and consider this uh, po pivotal portion of Scripture. And it is a very important portion of, of Scripture. Trevor's going to take us through the first three, love, joy, and peace. And I'll step back up and take us through the next three, which are long-suffering, kindness, and goodness. And then Trevor will come back up for the last three, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I'll come back up to discuss verse 24 and bring our thoughts to a close. Before we start on the fruit of the Spirit, let's quickly review the works of the flesh, the other side of the coin. The two lists are connected. There's a, there's a reason that they're back to back. That's not to say that they're similar. They are polar opposites. However, it appears that Paul is playing this second list off against the first list in a manner that compares and contrasts the two. And we're going to do that as we work through the second list. We're going to demonstrate the contrast between what the fruit of the Spirit is and what the works of the flesh are. The wickedness and godlessness and ugliness of verses 19, 20, and 21 is set off against the beauty and the tranquility and the godliness of verses 22 and 23. Now, to refresh your memory, here are the works of the flesh. There are 17 in our New King James Version Bibles. You may be looking at a version that has 15 of those. There will be a couple of them that you wouldn't notice. But we're going to use the NKJV uh, version and we'll note those 17. They were in four categories that we mentioned two weeks ago. The sexual sins, which were adultery, fornication. The word for fornication is pornea. And you can recognize a very modern word from that comes right out of that Greek term. Uncleanness and lewdness, those four are the sexual sins. Then the sins of false worship were idolatry and sorcery. And you might remember that when we talked about sorcery, that the word for sorcery is pharmakia. And you can hear pharmacy, which is a word for drugs. And the connection between drugs and, and uh, the occult has always been prominent, and it still is today. Then there were the social sins, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, and the word heresies, we, we usually think of that in terms of, of doctrinal heresy, but the word means factions, where a group splits off into, into different, different factions. And then envy, and murders, and then the substance sins, which were drunkenness and revelries. That completes the list in verses 19 to 21, but it doesn't exhaust the possibilities because at the end of the list, Paul says, and the like, meaning that the list could go on. You don't stop there and say, well, I haven't done those seven, any of those 17, therefore I haven't sinned. No. There are other things that you could be doing that would fit the concept of the works of the flesh. We're going to refer, refer to items on that list throughout the message as we contrast them with the fruit of the Spirit. Now I'm going to ask Trevor if he'll come up and introduce this first section and walk us through love, joy, and peace. All right, we talked a few weeks ago. I think Pastor talked about the Holy Spirit as being a guide. And at that point, he talked about how the Holy Spirit was almost as if a fisherman who knew his way around, he talked about ice fishing, kind of like he talked about ice fishing today, and how some people just know exactly what kind of bait you need to use, all those different things. I want to draw on a different analogy today before we get into it, because, again, we are following the Holy Spirit as we go through the fruit of the Spirit. 
Uh, so on a trail, you can have switchbacks, you can have rock fields that are hard to navigate through, you can have forks, and you have to decide which way am I going to go? Am I going to go to the right or am I going to go to the left? Uh, so uh, there are main challenges. And to stay on the straight and narrow, uh, it's important to remember that we do have a guide to help us to navigate through the area. And not only that, but he's there to help us through every terrain, through every area of our lives. So there's no area of our life that's uh, removed from God that God can't reach into or that we should keep from God. Uh, rather, we are to stay on God's path in every area of our lives. Also, uh, second part to this that we're going to look at, uh, in the weeks to come, we'll be talking about fruit a little bit more, and we have this idea of cultivation. Uh, Paul will talk more about how uh, what we spend our time sowing will produce something that will have an internal impact. Uh, so if a gardener plants a grapefruit, he or she should har expect to harvest a bad fruit. Well, at least to me, I would think a bad fruit. <laughs> But if a gardener decides to plant a cherry tree, he or she should expect to harvest good fruit. Amen. So, thank you. Yes, I agree. I like cherries too. Uh, and so, uh, you can't expect to grow an orchard with good fruit if you're constantly putting grapefruit in there into that orchard. <laughs> you have to find other trees that are going to produce good fruit so that it's going to have impacts. So you have to spend on it. And what you do does have a consequence. So you need to spend time dwelling on those things that are good and putting into action those things that are good, sowing them. Finally, uh, we are encouraged to allow the Spirit to work through us. And uh, so I won't go into detail. I have this analogy but basically, we can only obey God through the understanding he, he gives us. So we can't rely solely on our own strength. God has to work through us. It'd be like a novice cook being given a five-star restaurant chef's cookbook and yet ignoring it. And his master comes, he's ready for the banquet, and the sh cook says... I just uh, made my own rep recipes instead. How do you think the master is going to reward that servant? Uh, and so as we learn to live by the Spirit, as we obey what God communicates to us through the word, through his wise counsel, through circumstances, and through prayer, we really need to look to him instead of looking to our own understanding. All right, now that we've covered... A brief overview. Let's dive into this. Uh, we're going to start by going to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such, there is no law. As you look at that, uh, you may notice that there are nine through the Spirit. Uh, and we're going to go through them. If you look at the outline, you'll notice that we emphasize certain areas. So the first three fruit, love, joy, and peace, represent our relationship toward God. Let's first look at love. Now, as we talk through this in our study for Sunday Night Life, we uh, strive to come with a good definition. So the definition that I have here through studying and looking at different uh, resources, uh, the definition for love is a sacrifice or an aff affection directed towards protecting or caring for others. So let's look a little bit closer uh, Paul gives us a little clue what he was thinking about when he used the word love here. 
when he said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, For all of the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so then Paul is drawing our attention away to focus on loving your neighbor. And we could go into that more. We don't really have much time today to go into that. So I would encourage you to look at what Jesus said about loving your neighbor. What does that look like in practice, though? In John chapter 15, verse 13, and again, we're going to go in each of these fruit for my, the ones that I'm doing. We're going to go first to Galatians, then we're going to go to one other passage. So that's what you can ex expect with that. So John chapter 15, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And so it's a commitment. It's a sacrifice. And it's not a sacrifice that happens in the moment of some heroic act. It's something that's built into someone throughout their life as they learn to sacrifice for others. What makes love so distinctive? Like all of the first three, love is primarily directed towards God. Uh, we look to God to see his love and see how we are to live. We live by his example. Love is expressed through action and is not only affection. And it frees us from serving ourselves and combats pride. How does this contrast with the flesh, though? Love is not... And we're going to go through the list that he just mentioned. It is not slavery to lust, whether through adultery, fornication, uncleanness, or lewdness. Also, love is not slavery to promotion. It is not concerned about jealousy. It does not focus on envy or hatred. And third, love is not slavery to false worship. It does not dwell on idolatry, but rather praises worship on the one true God. And it is not focused on selfish ambi ambitions, our own agendas, to prove ourselves. Sec the second fruit that we are now going to look at is joy. Now, a definition for joy is a source or cause of keen pleasure or delight, especially in God. Paul does not mention joy in Galatians, but in another of his epistles, Philippians 4.4, 4, Philippians 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. And so we can see there the source of our joy is ultimately based in the Lord and what he has done for us. What does this look like in practice? Paul continued in Philippians chapter 4, looking at verses 12 and 13. By saying... I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so Paul recognized that no matter what situation we are in, we can turn it over to God and rejoice in him, to praise him for what he's done for us. What makes joy distinctive? Joy is an attitude of gratitude. Also, joy can be expressed through sorrow as well as happiness. It is not dependent on our circumstances. Rather, it stems from hope. Now let's contrast it with the flesh again. Joy 
It is not satisfaction with addictions, whether it be idolatry, sorcery, drunkenness, or revelries. And it is not satisfaction with pride, whether it be selfish ambitions, jealousies, or envy. Let's continue now and focus on peace. Now, peace, the definition for it is a harmonized relationship between God and man or between one person and another person or between one group and another group. In context, Jesus, or rather, Paul talked about how in Christ Jesus, uh, we are able to have peace. So let's look again at Galatians chapter 6, verses 15 through 16. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. And so it is not the law, as Paul has been going through this whole passage in Galatians, it's not the law which justifies us, but it is Christ Jesus and his sacrifice that avails, that allows us, because we are then in him a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them. So it unites us under Jesus Christ. In practice, you in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 44, Jesus again demonstrates to us what peace looks like when he says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And so peace transcends any enmity in the world. It allows us to show true forgiveness. In its essence, what makes Peace distinct is it is the solution for conflict. And it is only fulfilled because of God's sovereign rule. God is in control, and so we know that in the end, he will reign as king and is displayed through forgiveness. How does it compare to the flesh? It is not a solution by revenge, whether through hatred, outbursts of wrath, contentions or murders and it is not a solution by exclusion it is not through jealousies it does not act through jealousies or dissensions or heresies now wrapping all these three up what do love joy and peace look like in our relationship toward god someone who displays these fruit meditates on god's graciousness and remembers that god is the great shepherd the victor of all, and the judge. This person will turn to God when faced with trials, hard realities such as death or cancer or natural disasters or betrayal by a friend. This person exercises joy consistently and spends regular time with God even before the bad times come during the good times. Tag. The sec second section of the fruit builds on the first and seeks to cultivate strong relationships with others. Where the first three are cultivating a relationship with God, these next three are cultivating a relationship with others. Long-suffering is patience, if you want to use a one-word definition. It's the ability to put up with situations and people when it's not easy. We can put up with people we like. It's harder to put up with people that rub us the wrong way. 
And long-suffering is the ability to put up with people who rub us the wrong way. To put up with situations that irritate us. Some of you love to work on cars. I hate working on cars. I just hate it. Because every time I try to do something on a car, something else breaks. And it just irritates me. I, it, it's, no, it's, it's, uh, it, it's no fun for me to do that. I'm amazed to watch people who are good at working on cars to stand there and go through the same thing I went through and not lose it. Not walk in the house and say, give me a glass of water. I got to cool off. That car's driving me nuts. And to, to do that for a living, you guys who are mechanics and do it for a living, it's just amazing to me. Long-suffering is not being easily provoked. It's being even-tempered, working through problems without losing control. The comparison of what the Spirit is building in us and the temperament that God has toward us is hard to miss. In the Old Testament, Israel was a stiff-necked uh, and rebellious people. Yet God suffered long with them, working with them to bring about a godly nation. The reference I have here is Hosea 11, verses 1 through 9. We're not going to read that, but if you, if you go there and take a look at it, you will see that that's what God is saying. I have struggled with you, but I will not give up because I love Israel. In our day, the Lord is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3 Verse 9. Now this differs from the other fruit in its direction. Love, joy, and peace are directed primarily toward God, though they spill over to our relationships with each other as well. Long-suffering is a characteristic that is primarily directed toward difficult people and circumstances. People and things that bother us and could cause us to become angry. Long-suffering is the ability to put up with that, put up with those folks, Put up with those circumstances. By way of contrast, the Spirit of God works in each of us to temper the ego-driven short fuse that characterizes the works of the flesh. The social sins, the largest category of those works of the flesh, the one that starts with hatred and works its way all the way through murders. Those social sins include those things we just mentioned, plus contentions and jealousies and outbursts of wrath and selfish ambitions and dissension and factions and envy. You work through that list, not much of it relates to patience. In fact, we might say that a person who exhibits those life, life actions has no patience with others. How's God going to build this into your life? By bringing difficult people and situations into your life. Now, you might say to yourself, I don't, I don't like that. I don't like it either. But it's how God builds long-suffering into us. You don't, you don't grow fruit with constant sunshine. There has to be rain. And in order for God to build long-suffering into you, He's going to have to bring people and situations and problems into your life that you have to work at. The second of these is kindness. In the King James, it's called gentleness. The quality of being helpful or beneficial. In Psalm 34, verse 8, it says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. But actually in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the word is kind. Same word is here. In 1 Peter 2, verse 3, Peter uses the same word. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious or kind, same Greek word that's used there. Love, 1 Corinthians 13, 4, and this is the reason we read that earlier today. Love is kind. This differs a little bit from the other fruit in its selfless desire to encourage and build others up. It seeks to be a support, seeks to be an encouragement, seeks to be a benefit to those that God brings into our lives. If you go back to the works of the flesh, how many of the works of the flesh do you think are unkind? 
<laughs> yeah, you, you can make a case that oh, they all are, but especially adultery. Wouldn't adultery be unkind to your spouse? Hatred. Whoever you hate, you're unkind toward. Contentions. That's a fight. Outbursts of wrath. Those, all those things are unkind. To live in the flesh is to live a selfish, unkind life. One that does not consider others, and especially is not kind toward them. It is not helpful. It is not beneficial. It's selfish and hurtful. How will God build kindness into your life? He's going to build kindness into your life by bringing people into your life who have needs. The same thing, by the way, is true of the next one we're talking about, which is goodness. God will bring people into your life who have needs. Again, it's easy to be kind to people you like. It's easy to be kind to people who meet your needs. It's more difficult to be kind to the person who has needs particularly if maybe they aren't necessarily um, on the same page as you in a lot of things in life. God will bring people into your life who have needs in order to build kindness into you. And then the third of these is goodness. The concept of generosity, generosity is inherent in the word that's translated goodness, which is pretty rare in the New Testament. It's only used four times, and all four times by Paul. It's closely related to the concepts surrounding kindness. It's really not a very different word. Except that the person who is good is willing to go out of his way to serve another. The concept of service is there. If you were going to distinguish this between kindness and goodness, I would say that kindness is more the attitude side of this, where goodness is more the action side of this. So my kindness will result in goodness. That's the concept between the two words and how they were used, they are used here together. Now, how can we be good? Jesus said, "No one is good but one." That's God. That's Matthew chapter nineteen, verse seventeen. You remember that exchange with the rich young ruler? Good master, why do you call me good? Nobody could be good except one. That's God. Well, we can be good because God is working in us. Remember, these are the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is the one who's building this. You won't be good on your own. You'll be good because the Spirit of God is moving in your life. This differs from other fruit in its focus on being a servant. As I said, it's closely related to kindness, but the servant emphasis is maybe a bit stronger, and the, and the emphasis on doing rather than being is maybe a bit stronger in the word for kindness. Once again, the list of the works of the flesh that contrasts to this idea of generosity and service is practically complete. I mean, all of the works of the flesh are going to be contrary to this concept of being good. We don't need to go over them again, but you get the idea. This is a product of the work of the Spirit in the life of the believer. It's not what the flesh normally produces. And God, again, is going to build this into your life by bringing people into your life who have needs and whose needs you can meet. Now, what, is, what, is, what do these three look like in my life? Well, how, what, what does this look like when God begins to build these into my life? The first one, long-suffering, looks like a hard person to rattle. If you're confronted by a person who challenges you or circumstances that put you on edge, long-suffering allows you to take that deep breath. My dad used to say, count to ten. And I used to say, and then can I blow up? <laughs> no, the idea of count to ten is by the time you get to ten, maybe you won't be blowing up anymore. Take a deep breath. View the situation from God's perspective. View the person from God's perspective. And patiently work through it. And in the meantime, see them as God sees them. Try to help. Be kind. Provide emotional support, physical support to people in need and serve others with no thought of return. And that brings us to faithfulness. Did you know that how we treat ourselves 
the encouraging thoughts or the dumb talk we preach to ourselves, the way we treat our bodies actually says something about our spiritual walk as well? Let's start by looking at faithfulness. Faithfulness, as I defined it, is a resolute, resolute persuasion of the existence of God and of the truth of his word. What did Paul have to say about this? Galatians 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Our faith is centered upon Christ's death and resurrection. Without it, we would have no faith, no reason to live. And again, the Bible emphasizes the fact that without faith, it's useless. Because in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. What does this look like in contrast to the flesh? One, it is not a rejection of God's design. It is not adultery or fornication or uncleanness or envy or jealousies, all of these which were not a part of God's design, and yet we sinned and turned against that design. Also, second, it is not a rejection of God's glory, whether through idolatry or selfish ambitions, when we place something else in our heart on the throne above God. And third, it is not a rejection of God's word. It is not contentions or dissensions or heresies, which are ultimately a disrespect to God who created people in his image. And when we are not able to get along with them and speak truth into their lives or to stand on truth or to go to God's word to resolve our conflicts, we are, in an essence, rejecting God's word. What is so distinctive about faithfulness? Well, like all of the uh, three, whether it's gentleness, faithfulness, or self-control, is directed towards ourselves through a spiritual discipline. Also, faithfulness is ultimately not based on what can be seen, but rather looking to faith to God and what he has done. It is our access to God in response to his love. And it is our means of salvation, of obtaining life after death. Moving on to the next one, the fruit of gentleness. What defines gentleness? Gentleness is a balance of force and reserve informed by wisdom. In context with what Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. It is this gentleness that moderates how we talk to others. And again, this is a more of an emphasis on what we say and how we say it. In practice, uh, Colossians 3.12 verse 13 says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. And here it's talking about meekness is the same as gentleness. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. How does this contrast with the flesh? Well, first, it is not criticism for manipul with manipulation, whether through lewdness or heresies or dissensions, and also it is not criticism by venting, whether through hatred or contentions or outbursts of wrath. Rather, gentleness is marked by 
the way that it represents a spoken aspect of prudence or wisdom. It addresses a person's attitude about their reputation, and it concentrates on humility when speaking as God's child, as his representative. Let's now look at the fruit of self-control. As defined, it is a mastery over one's desires and passions. And Galatians 5.13 says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And so it is important to remember that liberty is tied closely to self-control. Also, Paul recognized this when he said, and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. And so an athlete um, disciplines themselves, they might uh, withhold certain things, whether it be certain drinks that they choose not to drink, or a certain diet, or a certain exercises that they go under, in order to be an athlete. And we have a similar discipline as we serve God to represent him and to run the race that he's called us to. How is this contrast with the flesh? Well, first off, self-control is not liberty to lust. It is not through adultery or fornication or uncleanness. Second, it is not liberty to recklessness. It is not whether in vile idolatry or whether through sorcery or drunkenness or revelries where we are out of control. How is this, uh, how, what distinguishes gentleness? And, I mean, excuse me, self-control? Whereas gentleness is spoken, self-control is lived out in purity. Self-control focuses on being pure and protecting purity. It displays modesty. It also emphasizes discernment between what is good, what is bad, and what is best. Just to wrap this up, since we don't have much more time to dwell on this, um, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, they look like a person who is willing to be unashamed of God and stands on truth and doesn't bend their morals to fit what people say. Let's look shortly at verse 23. At the end of it, it said, Paul said, against such things there is no law. And so all of these fruit of the Spirit, there is no law against it. And Paul set this up uh, in the first verse of chapter 5 when he said, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And then so again, he's telling these believers not to go back to the Jewish law, but rather to live in the liberty of Jesus Christ through his sacrifice. Uh, and so we are not to um, concentrate on the law, but rather he's taking it a step above and saying that these are not moderated by love, but rather the fruit of the Spirit are given to obey God and to please him as he works through us and accomplishes it as he develops it every single day of our lives. All right, we're going to wrap this up by looking at verse 24. The end result of walking in the Spirit and allowing Him to build these character traits into us is what we see in verse 24. The result is victory over the flesh. Several things point to that victory. He says in verse 24, And those who are, pardon me, and those who are Christ's, we belong to Christ. That's the first thing. We are His. The word Christ's is possessive. That means I don't fight this battle alone. In fact, I don't do anything with respect to the fruit of the Spirit on my own. I am His, and He fights alongside of me. And He's the one who sent the Holy Spirit to live within me, who builds these fruit into me. I don't need the law to restrain the flesh. I have Christ in the Spirit of God. And He goes on to say, 
and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh. Now, that phrase says, we have crucified, those who are, who are Christ's, us, we have crucified the flesh. But it seems as if throughout Galatians, Paul is saying, no, you don't do this. You don't do this by the works of the law. The Spirit of God does this in you. So how did we crucify the flesh? I'm going to take you back to another verse that, that uh, Trevor mentioned just a moment ago, Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, he made it possible for us to live as God wants us to live. And when we trust Christ as our Savior, we take on his death. We become crucified with Christ. So when he says, those who are Christ have crucified the flesh, we didn't do that by ourselves. I am Christ by faith because when he died, I died. When I placed my faith in Christ, his death became my death. His crucifixion was my crucifixion. His victory over death became my victory over death. The result is that the flesh no longer has control over me. And he goes on to say that those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. When you look at the works of the flesh, the passions and desires of the works of the flesh are in control. When you look at the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit of God is in control. The passions and desires of the old life no longer drive me. Why? Because I am so good? Because I'm better than other people? A lot of folks look at Christians and say we've got our nose in the air, we think we're better than everybody else. Well, if you have that attitude, you're wrong. We are not better than anybody else. All we have done is recognize that we are sinners and place our faith in Christ to save us from our sin. The Spirit of God is the one that starts doing the work in us. I want to read you a quote. This is from Tom Schreiner, who wrote an exegetical commentary on the New Testament with a focus on Galatians. Where there is sexual sin, self-absorption and self-worship, strife and quarreling and dissolute lives under the control of drugs and alcohol, the flesh is in control. Where there is love, harmony, joy, forgiveness and kindness, we see the power of the Spirit. The Galatians are not called upon to work at being more virtuous. That's an important statement. The Galatians, I'll read it again. The Galatians are not called upon to work at being more virtuous. They are summoned to walk in the Spirit and to be led by the Spirit. Living in a way that pleases God is the fruit of His miraculous work and not the results of self-effort, though human beings are called upon to walk in the Spirit and yield to the Spirit. So it's the Spirit who does this in us, not us. And that's an important distinction. The fruit of the Spirit is a result of the Spirit's sanctifying work in the life of a believer. Any believer. You don't have to be super Christian. You don't have to, you don't have to be the elite of the Christian life, if there is such a thing, and there's not, in order to experience the fruit of the Spirit. That is available to any Christian who will walk in the Spirit of God. It's a dramatic change from the self-centered nature of the life described in the works of the flesh. So what does your life look like? Is it characterized by a self-centered, pleasure-driven, pleasure confrontational life? Are those the thoughts and actions that characterize your life? Or is it growing closer to Christ daily as you walk in the Spirit and becoming more like what we read in verses 22 and 23? Let the Spirit of God have control and love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control will blossom in your life. 